Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Stephen Carter, I'm Editorial Director, and I'll be uh, chairing today's IGB webinar. Uh, today, we're delighted to be hosting a webinar with uh, YouGov. Uh, today, we're discussing the Tech Futures Survey, uh, the view on innovation and disruption in uh, 2022. Uh, today, we'll be reviewing and discussing some key findings from this year's survey into the tech that's going to drive industry growth and evolution. Uh, we're also analysing how this is going to impact processes in critical areas such as player protection and data security. Our panel for today is Oliver Rowe, who's Global Sector Head, Leisure and Entertainment, and Director of Reputation and Business Research for YouGov, uh, who's going to kick things off with a very uh, sort of a brief uh, presentation on the findings. We're also joined by Lloyd Purser, who is Chief Operating Officer for Funfair Technologies, Christina Tabatu, who is uh, Chief Techn Technology Officer for Shared Play, Andreas Kerbel, who is Chief, Chief Executive Officer for Bet Games, and Last but not least, we have Mitchell Feldman, who's Chief Marketing Officer for Future Anthem. Anthem. Unfortunately, our moderator, Stefan Kovac, uh, who's the founder of Rare Things, uh, has some technical problems that's uh, preventing him from joining today. Um, anyway, I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves more fully shortly. Uh, before I do that, though, um, I'll hand over to Oliver, actually, uh, of the panel, and then Oliver will do his presentation. There'll be a Q&A section following the presentation, so please do submit questions as we go along. And we'll try to address as many of these in these, uh, these questions as possible in the allocated time. Anyway, I'm going to hand over to the panel for quick introductions, and then, then I'm going to go to Oliver for, for a brief overview of the, uh, of the headline findings. Okay, so who wants to go first? So we start with you, Oliver. Yes, very happy to. Thanks, Stephen. Um, Oliver Rowe, as, as you said, I'm Global Sector Head for Leisure and Entertainment at YouGov. Um, for those of you who don't know YouGov, we're a market research company, global market research company. We conduct uh, gambling work with um, providers of all kinds, including uh, trade organizations, regulators, and uh, B2B and B2C businesses around the world. Um, uh, at the heart of our, what we do is a, is a panel of respondents and uh, uh, delighted today, though, that we've got people who have been who are watching, who have actually taken part in the survey rather than just our panelists. So I'll be coming on to that shortly, but uh, great to be here. Uh, should, we go to, should we go to Christina next? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Um, by the way, uh, one one small comment that uh, SharePlay is now beyond play. Uh, just to, to make Sorry the connection that. together and no, no, absolutely no problems. And uh, we are working uh, in trying to make the one to one experience for, for gaming into multiplayer. Uh, and ha I personally have been in the industry for the past nine years, I think, already. So I, I'm looking forward to seeing the results. Fantastic. Um, Lloyd, want to go next? Sure, yeah. So uh, my name is Lloyd Purser. I'm CEO of Funfair Technologies. Um, we've been involved in blockchain gambling space for or nearly five years now, I think, going back to 2016. Um, and we've since, uh, done a couple of other things. Uh, we have a multiplayer gambling game studio, uh, which distributes content into the regulated gambling markets. Uh, and we also most recently, um, just the beginning of this year, launched a small uh, venture capital business called Funfair Ventures, which invests in early stage blockchain projects. So quite a few different things going on. Yeah, a lot going on there. Thanks, Lloyd. Uh, uh, Andreas? Yeah, hi, I'm Andy. I'm CEO of uh, Bad Games. We are a live dealer supplier uh, for the iGaming industry. So we are producing 24 7 live games, I would say, not uh, live casinos because we're not actually doing traditional casino to the industry. I'm in the software industry since uh, 15 years or 16 years uh, within the iGaming industry. Since six years before that, I used to work for Microsoft and in the aerospace industry, which is actually my initial profession. I'm an engineer uh, coming from, from aerospace. Um, and I did uh, quite a lot of research on the uh, diffusion of, accept of um, disruptive technology. So happy to share some insights today and uh, happy to be here. Thanks, Andy. And Mitchell? Uh, yeah, hey, Mitchell Feldman. I am the CMO of Future Anthem. Um, for those that don't know who Future Anthem are, we're purporting to be one of the most disruptive partners in the gambling ecosystem, and we're on a mission to humanize data to help 
studios and operators grow sustainably um, with the power of our platform. Thanks, Mitchell. Okay, um, right, um, Oliver, do you, uh, over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, I shall share my screen, uh, which I'm hoping you're able to see. Um, um, is everybody able to see, see my screen? Yeah, I think you might need to flip them, Oliver. Like, okay. The presenter screen rather than the, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, that option has disappeared for me. <laughs> uh, how about now? I don't know. I still will get in the next slide, but I think then we can work with that. We we'll make it bigger, maybe. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if Erin's still on the background is able to share the um, presenter Aaron? option again. And while she's trying to do that, let me let me crack on anyway. See what uh, if we can make a start. But um, we're going to take you through the results of the uh, the Tech Future Survey, which we've run. Um, the survey was live on the IGB website, so hopefully many of you who are watching this um, uh, uh, completed the survey. Uh, so many thanks to all of you that did. Uh, in terms of uh, survey participants, we had 66 people complete the survey, and uh, the results you're going to see were uh, collected up until uh, the beginning of this week. Just in terms of who's taken the survey, uh, I'm hoping you can see this because it's quite small on my screen. Um, in terms of the companies who took part, uh, about a third were from B2C firms, uh, about a quarter from B2B, and about a quarter from agencies and consultants. Uh, about half of the respondents were board or C-suite uh, level, and the majority of respondents are from medium size and small firms. In terms of markets that people are focused on, 45% uh, uh, focused on Europe, 27% the Americas, 15% Africa, similar number for Asia. Okay, so let's have a look at the survey results themselves. So first up, um, in terms of the first question we asked was around uh, the use of transformative tech, uh, most immediately transformative for the industry. And people were given these various options, they could select as many as they wished. And just under half said that AI ML for personalization was going to be um, the, the most important, the most immediately transform, transformative for the industry. Blockchain is just behind 42%, and then AI ML for strategic automation, and also for RG at 35%, uh, VR AR a little bit further back. Very few people selecting IoT or edge computing. The follow-up question to this was then, uh, which of these do you think to be most useful to your company in the coming year? Again, AI ML for personalization comes top, but AI ML for strategic automation comes second here. Uh, it's interesting when we look at the difference between the B2C and the B2B firms, the B2C firms um, still think it's AI ML for personalization, uh, which will be most useful for them this year but the strategic automation comes through for the B2B firms. For agencies and consultancies, uh, it's the responsible gambling element that's thought to be most transformative and useful. There was a follow-up question to this as well, which was around um, uh, IoT and blockchain, where a third of people didn't think they were relatively uh, well understood by the industry or necessarily relevant either. For the um, next question, we asked about uh, leverage of, disru of, of disruptive tech and um, which people feel their company is most likely to leverage in-house. Um, no real winner here. In fact, all those top four getting sort of equal billing with AI ML for personalization, just about winning through. And would this be done in-house or, or outside or some other way? Well, 44% of respondents say it would be based on training up in-house capability. 
a similar number for using an external provider or agency and also existing trained in-house capacity. Uh, it's different though between the B2B and uh, B2C firms. The B2B firms are more likely to say they would use existing trained in-house capability, which really sort of shows that uh, the skills are, are already in place for many. But just one other point on this, I thought it was interesting to see about a quarter of people talking uh, that they would use a merger or acquisition to get the work done. Um, in terms of ethical concerns around uh, AI and uh, uh, gaming, they sort of fall into three areas. Uh, firstly, positives around AI, but with uh, guidance required. Second area, sort of limitations to AI based on concerns around trust or around quality. And thirdly, uh, just blatant misuse. With the, the, the positive side, um, there's an interesting comment at the bottom left here. I think there needs to be a set of ethical guidelines adopted by the industry to apply the use of AI-driven solutions that adhere to ESG principles. In terms of the limitations around trust and quality, uh, comment there, quality uh, chatbots are limited to template replies and also over-relying on the AI and forgetting the personal assessment. And then in terms of misuse, we've got unethical uses that target at-risk gamblers and also dynamic bonusing exploits and AI being corrupted by malicious agents. So an interesting spectrum of, of uh, answers written in by respondents for that one. In terms of the impact of AI, um, where people see it having the most immediate and significant impact for the sector, data and analytics comes top with two thirds picking it, around half then say personalization or automation, and then compliance and chatbots coming through after that. Um, personalization and automation uh, tend to come top for B2C and B2B firms. It's the uh, agencies and consultants that have really pushed through the data and analytics response to this question. And just a note on blockchain for iGaming. I thought this is interesting um, asking people whether they feel blockchain has got much application uh, beyond just cryptos. Th there's no um, majority here, but a plurality do say yes, it, it does. Um, but uh, that's uh, pushed up by the B2C firms responding. B2B firms are more like to say no. And then um, we have a quarter who are unsure. Um, sorry, can you still see the, my screen or has it just jumped off? You can still see it. Okay. Um, in terms of the statements, we asked three statements. Um, the first one is around uh, regulators having a responsibility to both monitor and encourage the development of new iGaming technology. Um, sorry, I'm having some problems with my screen now. Um, we've got 71% um, agreeing with that first statement. The second statement, iGaming industry is good at adopting and fully utilizing disruptive technologies. Uh, a bit more of a split, uh, about half agreeing and a quarter disagreeing. And then finally, that COVID-19 has demonstrated the need for iGaming operators to use disruptive technologies better, half agreeing with that one. We did ask about the importance of disruptive technology uh, to adoption for your firm and um, which of these positions reflects uh, the individual companies uh, and where they are. Um, we've got just over a quarter saying it's important for my company to be at the forefront, but not actually leading development. A quarter also saying that we need to employ them when they become more relevant, but we don't need to be the first to use them. And also a quarter saying it's important for my company uh, to be developing new iGaming technologies uh, to be sort of more at the forefront. And then what impact will the uh, technologies have? Um, I think it's interesting here that we have bringing new customers to the sector as being the top answer, but that is really driven by the uh, uh, B2B and agency and consultants. Uh, giving that response. The B2C firms are more likely to say that it's preventing loss of current customers and attracting new customers from competitors. We also have quite a few responses here for um, boosting spend from existing customers, reducing harm, preventing loss to uh, competitors, but also bringing offline gamblers online is set to buy a quarter. 
very few people talking about reducing overheads or boosting profitability. And then finally, just to finish, um, two other statements we asked about RG. Uh, firstly, all new iGaming technology must have RG at its core, and we have 72% agreeing with that. But then a pretty even split on the second statement that new iGaming technology is the only way to ensure responsible gambling online in the future. Okay, those are all the results that's going to run through. Uh, hopefully some interesting uh, results there and some uh, useful background for our panel discussion. Stephen, I'll, I'll pass back to you. Thank you very much, Oliver. Uh, as you say, some really interesting insights there and just great this year to have that um, that breakdown of the audience as well, you know, from the B2C, B2B side as well, because we didn't have those insights before. So that's fantastic, thank you. Um, well, I think, I think um, I'm going to open this discussion up a bit further now, so I've got an idea of the interest, industry's interest and appetite to engage in, new, in these new technologies. Uh, so I, mean, I, just, I want to kick off, the first thing I want to kick off with is this appetite for innovation and engagement with new solutions. I mean, is the, is the gambling industry innovative? I mean, in, 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 in recent years, I think there's always been this criticism, hasn't there, um, that the, government, the, the industry hasn't been innovative enough and just has relied upon the same same kind of reliant technologies and solutions. Um, so I mean, is, it, is the industry now innovative in the panel's view? Is it a, is it a pioneer or a follower? Um, who wants to take that one first? I don't mind. Um, yeah, in my view, it's not um, that innovative. It's not, um, there, there are various reasons for that. Um, one is being heavy reg regulation. Um, and I think what we what you, what we have seen in the past, especially if you look at things like blockchain or crypto, is you've seen the innovation come from more from the less regulated areas, and then will it move into the will it move into areas of heavy regulation? It will with time, um, but it's hard for regulators to, um, you know, keep abreast of all the technology and how that's going to impact players. Right? It's not easy. Uh, it's hard, uh, and I think that's a, one and, and a key reason why it, it's. Um, you know, any heavy, heavily regulated industry might find it harder to innovate because you're constantly working around regulations which are in essence probably relatively old i mean we're still in a process where you know many countries including the us are just regulating online and that's been around I don't know, decades <laughs> and 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 it's still not regulated fully right so how 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 do they move forward to regulate web3 and um, decentralized casinos that operate in a different way uh, with different currency, with currency that's not regulated either. Um, so, you know, that, that I think that it, from my perspective, looking at the blockchain space, um, it's not innovative, but it is difficult. Um, but I also think there's an element of if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, that, that happens quite a bit. And if, if you look at our game studio, you know, we're pushing our game studio uh because we see a gap in the market mainly again recognizing trends coming out of crypto that there's a community-based social uh, style of gameplay that's just not being catered for in the in the gambling space um and we've seen it that players different style of players different types of players are playing these games elsewhere mainly again in unregulated markets with no protection um and we're trying to bring that style of gameplay into the regulated markets um is that really innovation? Is it just creating a new style of content? I think I think there is an element of um, I don't know if I would I wouldn't call it laziness. That may be a bit strong, but there is a, a an element of if, if it's not broke, don't fix it. And I think that um, you know that 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 will come that will create problems, and and the industry needs to move forward and start looking at how you're going to attract different customers because they are just going to go and play play their games and have their entertainment elsewhere. Mitchell. That classic come off mute. I think yeah. that we're, I think actually we're at a paradigm shift in the industry. I think that the technology has got to a stage now where it's become useful with the evolution of things like cloud, where AI and has become much more um, reachable and useful than it's ever been before. And I think that casinos are now realizing that AI is actually something that can be sewn into the tapestry of how they operate their business. And what I mean by that is attaching metadata to everything that they do. Because if we look at regulation, regulation is really accountability and responsibility. 
And actually, if you can, at a granular level, understand what is going on with the player, you can actually create amazing outcomes. And that's not just around RG, that's around creating personalized experiences. So I think the industry is ready. We are seeing a significant shift in the way that people are adopting our technology in particular, in the way that they are bringing that into their tech stack, making it that must have growth ingredients because the enrichment of the data that they're collecting, which historically has been ignored, actually we're now turning that into some three dimensional model that if you look at it through different lenses, gives them the ability to go to places they've never been able to reach before. Whether that, as I say, whether that's personalization, whether that's building games that are data driven, actually learning from the players. So I think that the market is ready. I think the technology is ready. It's just around shifting that mindset. That the old way is not necessarily the only way. And you know, we're, we're on a mission to do that ourselves. Yeah, I would like to add a bit here, maybe. I mean, I think what we also have, I mean, in principle, I agree with what, what Lloyd and Mitchell said. I think when you look, for example, when you look at sports, I mean, what was the last innovation that, that was introduced in sports? I think it was like cash out 10 years ago or something like that. Um, and I, I think we have to distinct between innovation in the back end, in the field of the back end, and innovation in the field of the content. Right. I think there is absolutely no innovation, almost no innovation, and actually COVID actually showed it uh, in the field of content. Right. I mean, out of the sudden, tish tennis or table tennis was the was the number one sports uh, and the number one content because there was nothing else in a bit of, of esports. But I think, uh, as as Mitchell said, I think technology readiness reached very much driven by the democratization of technology through cloud etc reached a level where we see more and more and more innovation from a back-end perspective yeah, AI etc etc that probably won't necessarily give us content innovation in the near future but will drive a lot of information uh, innovation from let's say the suppliers or the op uh, operators point of view giving them new solution space, giving them new ways to acquire, to retain, to manage customers, um, tackling compliance issues. Look at the German market regulation. Yeah. They are lacking to introduce a regulation after 15 years or whatever that can't be enforced because they cannot share um, the data across the operators, which the blockchain could actually solve. That doesn't create value for the player in terms of new content or innovation in terms of content, but actually is, is, is highly innovative for the operator because it solves some significant problems. So I think that's an important differentiator we should, we should add here when we talk about innovation and is the, or is the industry innovative um, or not. And, and maybe as a last sentence here, as I said, democratization of IT now as a startup, as a one person, as a two person, as a, as a group of students, I can create my own game studio um, out of nothing, right? I have cloud services, I have, I have blockchain as a service, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these are possibilities and opportunities that weren't existent five years ago. So I think this will drive a lot of, of innovation, also content innovation going forward. Um, but again, I think it's really important to distinct the two the two sides, content versus, let's say, the back end. I, th I think it's really interesting, Andreas. And I think that if you look at the construct of a greenfield site casino, brand new casino versus one of the, um, the existing uh, well-known providers, you'll see that the tech stack and the approach to the development is completely different. And, and, and I guess that, you know, building it into be data driven from day one, is a, is a uh, characteristic of a new casino. So we will see like, you know, Christina's business, the, 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 these disruptors who are coming in and are quickly accelerating because they don't have any of that legacy debt, technical debt to deal with. They're building in new frameworks. So what I can see in short order is that these new disruptors coming on board will soon become the major players. Hopefully Christina and co. Um, and 
look, I did, what I've seen also is uh, large companies, even though they have the resources, they have the information, uh, definitely, and, and they have a lot of experience in the industry, they don't innovate that much and, and they like small innovations get blocked along the way. Um, and I th either through like lack of resources or um, compliance or various uh, traps along the way. But I believe if companies in gambling could collaborate a bit more on the technological side or protocols or best practices, I think that would help a lot of companies relax a bit the pressure that it's on development or integration that take months at a time and be able to focus on innov innovations and have more confidence from the regulators because they're not so closed uh, together uh, from, from that side. And I think uh, data and, and showcasing how each and everything works together and how everything can be analyzed could be a step forward into increasing confidence in new technologies. I, I was going to say, Christina, I think one of the things that we're seeing from Future Anthem is that a lot of these organizations are working in silos. So you've got your compliance team, you've got your marketing team, you've got the CRM team, and they're all quite precious about their data. Um, actually, those that are realizing that if they can augment those data sets together and, and play nicely with each other, actually, they can accelerate that outcome. You know, I. I was speaking yesterday um, around, you know, if you look at the compliance team and looking at specifically through RG, the amount of data that they're having to harvest and understand to get to that point of how they can support the players, actually that same data set could be used for personalizing the lobby or building better games. And we're helping join those parts together. But I think some of, from a cultural perspective, um, some of the operators and studios need to revisit how they collaborate on data. Thanks, Mr. John. Um, right, we've kind of sort of it's been touched upon a couple of things there. I mean, I want to, I want to return to regulation in a minute because uh, we kind of have to really. Um, it's, uh, it is incredibly, it is incredibly fundamental, isn't it? Um, I do want to just sort of touch on the this next generation question as well, because I mean, right, Lloyd touched upon it, you know, about, you know, is the is the, is what's the industry, how is the industry kind of positioning itself? And you know, if it doesn't kind of um, engage this, ne this next audience, then it is, it's going to become an internet option that isn't able to compete, right? I mean, so to see, uh, Lloyd's kind of had his, Lloyd's, Lloyd's view is that it's not really, you know, it's not really doing that. And I guess we are kind of seeing, we are seeing those technologies come across, aren't we? You know, so Lloyd touched upon it as well about the technology, specific games like Crash and things that have been popular with um, skins, sort of skins gamblers and then that kind of space is made coming through to the mainstream. But I mean, what is the, what what is the industry actually doing to engage millennials or, and, Gen, and Gen Zs with this new technology? I mean, is it, is it making any progress in that respect or is it just, are we still facing that? That aging demographic and is, is technology how what, what what does the industry need to do about that then? Sorry, um, if, I, if I can contribute on on that, uh, at least from from our perspective with Beyond Play, we are trying to uh, touch on the younger industry that uses streaming as an entertainment. Uh, so there are a lot of people joining streamers now on Twitch uh, and as you've seen a lot of businesses and not, not only in gambling but in other kind of entertainment industries Netflix um, and Apple everyone is is going into shared experience shared uh, movies shared games uh, so I think that that area is uh, at really trying to touch with the younger industry that does a lot of things together they do they, they play games together they they see videos together and that kind of entertainment and could be brought into the gambling industry i think one of the things that the next generation will insist on is making it personal and i think that's where the industry does need to do a better job is that walking into a lobby with a thousand games none of which are relevant to the way that i play this next generation expect to play games and have experiences that are personal to them, not the top 10 of the operator that they've landed on. So they're expecting these uh, suppliers, whether it be the operator or the students, to provide them with games that absolutely stimulate them and continue to delight them 
throughout the journey on the site. Yeah, especially when you get used to Netflix suggesting the next movie to see and the next thing 100%. to do. And it's the same with Spotify, it's the same with Netflix. And that's what the industry needs to do, is it needs to run with pace towards that Netflix experience and build in tools and methodologies to allow them to deliver that. I, th I think that that's kind of good, but I think unless you address the content issue, it's like in Netflix of just black and white movies or something, you know, you, you kind of got to, you've got to get the content right. People go there to play games. I think there's a personalization bit. There's the whole experience around it. But if we don't start looking at the types of content that younger players who are coming into uh, the, you know, the gambling sphere want to play, uh, they're just not going to come because ultimately they're there to be entertained and play games. And the journey is incredibly important, but it's a journey to get you to a game, uh, to a game that you enjoy playing. And I think what we've seen definitely, we've tested a few different concepts, um, but what we've seen is that the the idea of what we might call multiplayer to single outcome games as they are at the moment, where you have lots of players playing against uh, the house, um, but they're playing in a in a room, let's say all together, um, that you add community elements in there, so they you know you, they can chat with each other. We have win celebrations, podium finishes, create a bit of FOMO, create some community uh, feel around that. But another key part is the feeling that they're actually playing with a strategy or some level of perceived skill. And, and uh, you know, in a crash game, for example, you make real-time decisions which impact whether you win or lose. Um, and we've seen that all of the, our most popular games definitely have a real-time decision-making element in there where, they, where, they, where the, the, the player is actively engaged in the game. It's not a passive experience where you push a button and it tells you the result. You are impacting whether you actually win or lose in, in that game. And I think that you know you've got to start looking at, at that kind of um, uh, those kinds of mechanics. So the multiplayer stuff and all that's good, but 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 also I think a more active experience, a less passive experience, that, that, that as you get much more with a slot game. So kind of going back to the experience you have when you go into a casino with your friends, and actually are able to make decisions on the spot on a table game or communicate and have fun. Absolutely, absolutely, um, and that's where we might start talking about things like metaverse. But you know that 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 is yeah. Uh, if you if you if you look at the most social buzzy place on a casino floor, it's the craps table, right? Um, generally, if, if you're at, you know in Vegas or, or anywhere in the US where craps is very popular, otherwise you know you've got roulette and you've got blackjack. But um, when you can get people like feeling that they're playing together, uh, I think you get a really really you get a strong response to that. Uh, and making decisions about whether they win or lose, you get a, res a very positive response to that too. Mm -hmm. I've been adding and to that um, what what I think, I mean, probably a couple of years ahead, but um, when we talk about personalization, content, the social experience, what we saw, what we see with younger generations is that they all see themselves as creators, right? Think about TikTok, Instagram, whatever, millions, billions of pieces of content, even if it's, it's images, it's videos, whatever, crazy things, dance moves, etc., are created every day. So um, I think especially when we look ahead, what is built upon the blockchain, talking about Web 3.0, um, that gives us a good opportunity to make the players or turn them from players into creators, give them some sort of opportunity to personalize games uh, by either creating their own games with a couple of clicks, creating their own casinos, creating their own corner in a casino, buying a piece of land in the central land and creating their own sports bar where they, invent, uh, they invite their community, their friends uh, to use standard services that we as a supplier can basically offer them as a template where they just click it together and offer it to their um, social community, et cetera. I think this is a huge, huge, huge opportunity, technically very, very difficult, but I think this is a big, big opportunity for the future, turning players into creators, allowing them to create their very individual experience and allowing them to offer it to their social um, communities. I think this is, probably one of the biggest opportunities in five, six, seven, ten years ahead. I think so. I I think in, uh, oh, sorry, I was going to say, um, in the other part of the business we work in, obviously, as mentioned, we've got a, a, 
a venture capital business that works in blockchain, uh, we're talking to a number of companies that are looking to provide services within the metaverse, um, whether that be Sandbox, Decentraland, whatever that might be. A lot of that is around personalization. We're talking with one which is um, is it basically a, a fashion marketplace where designers can can create uh, pieces and exclusive collections as NFTs that they then license to retailers in the metaverse to sell to people, to put on their avatars and to wear. Um, so, you know, there is this, this um, a simulation of real life is going to start happening very clearly in the metaverse. There's no reason why that couldn't happen in casinos. And there's no, you know, and, and people would be uh, wandering around the casino floor as they do in Vegas, um, but just doing that in a digital, in, you know, in a, in a virtual world. And I think, I think that's, I do think that's a huge opportunity that we have in front of us. And I think that that is another way that you're really going to uh, attract uh, that the, the younger, more tech-savvy audience that are interested in personalising have been playing things like, you know, Roblox and and and, and other games where they can really personalise um, their experience socially, talking with friends, playing with friends in the same rooms. Um, we need to bring this experience over to the gambling industry. Okay, so we just the panel kind of uh, agreed that uh, with Lloyd here that you know in terms of what we're talking about, this the importance of these. Uh, these per, of the personalization of the journey and the common experience and stuff that this is the technology it's it, this is really going to unleash is, is the metaverse is that the panel's uh is that the panel's view on I, I, I think not necessarily the metaverse but metadata is actually turning that granular i mean if i look at our world look at turning the transactional data you know we currently hold the world's largest behavioral data set about 58 billion transactions that we've ingested and growing two to three billion a month. You know, humanizing that data to really understand the players at a granular level, that will allow you to deliver experiences that are personalized and turn these players into fans. And that's what the next generation want, is they want to become fans of the brand. They don't just want the experience. And the experience is not just on site, it's off site. It's talking to the marketing teams, so that the messages are delivered just in time with the right messaging, with the right sentiment. And I think that's the massive opportunity, and it is an opportunity for operators and studios to embrace that. Yeah, I mean, I don't think the metaverse is, well, it's not new. The metaverse is not a new phenomenon. I mean, metaverse style games have been out since the web, right? Um, you could argue that the founders of Funfair created a, met, a gambling metaverse in PKR. Uh, which was a you know a three three D poker room uh, where people could chat and 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 you know in there that that is potentially a metaverse as well. But Fortnite's a metaverse, Roblox is a metaverse. So the, the idea of the metaverse isn't new. It's just the idea of ownership and true ownership that blockchain gives you within the metaverse, which is a very powerful um, I think is a very powerful tool and will will enable enable it to to grow. Is is that the killer application for innovation in the gambling industry? I think I think I think moving forward to attract um, a different type of player, I think it I think it will become more important. I think the people that get it right will will benefit from it um, in a big way. So and think, even yeah. though a lot, sorry, even though a lot of innovation is aimed at players, uh, I do think that a lot of innovation can happen within the processes of the companies themselves. To make them more agile and make them faster in adopting te new technology because even when you want to introduce something new as you were saying a lot of companies have a, a lot of legacy technology that they need to update and so on so if there is investment in automation of tasks or processes uh, i think that could help a lot uh, the companies to be able to adapt faster to the changing markets Fantastic. Okay. Uh, do you think the in terms of cryptocurrencies, do you think that's kind of um, effectively obscured the the sort of the deeper value and potential of blockchain in a way, and that we're just kind of starting to see this is a blockchain emerge now after after a, a number of years. I mean, it's always been it's always going to be blockchain year, isn't it, in the gaming industry? And now, do you think that now it's kind of come out from behind that the cryptocurrency kind of uh, obscuring that in a way? Well, I think cryptocurrency was the most simplest form of using blockchain for gambling initially uh, as a payment method. Um, that that was its, its most simple way of integrating uh, blockchain into gambling. Uh, and now I think it will move forward further. 
um you know most of the most of the casinos that started in as crypto only casinos have all in, in now have got fiat on ramps as well so i think it was just it was a good place for them to to be able to come in and acquire and you know i would imagine that those ones will be probably innovating further using blockchain tech because that's what they're comfortable with so um yeah i, I just think that the explosion of nfts and recently the obviously the explosion in discussion around you know metaverse which obviously nfts are wholeheartedly connected to um it, it, it's uh it's a bit like guys at the moment um but i do think that those are two very powerful tools as well for the gaming industry as well as uh, responsible gambling as, as much as we've been talking around about data as well and an ability to uh, utilize data in an open ledger uh you know that, that is data that people can see and act on uh, rather than having um you know silos of data uh, why not have uh, more open access to data so that you know regulators can actually act upon it okay interesting um so in terms of blockchain um this is something that emerged from the, uh, from the findings here is um you know obviously is rg is a is, is protecting players i mean yeah, just want to hit the panel the panel's view on sort of how blockchain blockchain technology is going to help the gambling industry with that then um um, Mitchell, do you want to kind of uh, show, show a view on this now about how it's going to how it's going to intersect with that now going forward? Um, I just think it will just help with accountability, having that irrefutable database. Um, I okay. think uh, Lloyd's point before about these crypto casinos now reverse engineering to allow fear on ramp um, is relevant. But what's interesting is is that they've taken all of that learnings from the crypto world. And reverse engineered it to, to bring and mature their their, their casino so I don't, does blockchain have a place yes it does but it's an, it's an underlying technology i think it should be ubiquitous to, to, to who's using it i don't think that the player would ever be aware of it i think it's more around accountability those smart contracts is where it becomes interesting okay Thanks, Mitchell. Has anyone got anything to add on that one? I think it, it also can be used to, to make data more secure, to avoid if there's any leak of data, to make sure that uh, everything is protected and signed. And, and as Mitchell was saying, with accountability and, and making sure that everything goes well. Yeah, I, I, I think one thing that's interesting is I agree is that if you look at it through the lens of RG, you know, one of the things that the operators don't do well today, and Andreas mentioned it before about in Germany, is the need or the want to share data to understand how they can protect the players. You know, perhaps putting it on the blockchain um, and sharing data in a trusted um, and reliable source it may be a good use for the blockchain. But uh, as and I say, and that would help with also GDPR restrictions when it comes to sharing data and. and could help um, problematic players from jumping from one casino to another to avoid uh, various exactly. restrictions. Exactly, It'd like specifically helping that use case, those tourists who are going from one casino to another, actually collaborating in a safe way between these operators is actually really protecting the players. Okay, so you're sort of suggesting that, for example, could that sort of, could this technology disrupt it in the sense that the, it help you achieve the sort of single customer view that the Gambling Commission here in Great Britain is pushing for? In terms of potential, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it definitely could, uh, but it would require everybody to use the same tech, um, or everyone yeah. to adhere to the same standards and 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 use the same technology. Um, but yes, um, you know, you you could have a marker um which uh is, is on the blockchain which says this player can play or this player can't play and as long as everyone is using the same um source of truth then the player can play or they can't play basically <laughs> uh wow. so you know it's a single source of truth which is the key thing i think the key to it is the speed and access to that data as well to protect the players you know doing rg in real time that scale and that speed is incredibly important. And if the blockchain facilitates that, then fantastic. 
but really you know we we run our model against we do bake-offs with some of our customers are looking at their models and, you know we're finding players faster than they are substantially faster than they are uh, players at risk and we're, and we're finding more of them so there is no common standard so actually i think from my, through the lens that i'm looking at is if the industry could align to a single protocol a single standard when it comes to things like rg um, would be a massive shift but you're moving a nine-ton whale and pointing it in the other direction it's not easy okay. sorry about that i just realized that so my, my power is running down so I'm just checking my computer is plugged in so that just disappeared then um then we also have anything to, uh, to add on that on the in terms of the the rg uh Perspective of this because this is something that came out very very strongly in the um, in the survey, didn't it? So, okay. I mean, do you think does anyone is, does anyone see there's a conflict in terms of um, some of the tech AOM blockchain in particular um, can help from a compliance perspective as well as driving more play? I mean, do you think there's a conflict of interest here between the use of those technologies, or can that can that can that be managed and balanced? Probably, <laughs> probably some kind of conflict. <laughs> You've got one tech which is trying to get people to gamble and another tech which is trying to protect people that shouldn't be gambling too much. So, uh, yeah, there's probably some conflict. I don't know how you find that balance. I'm kind of glad I'm not involved in that. Yeah. Uh, uh, there you go. I was just going to say is that, you know, turning the, those compliance teams, those RG teams who are just focused on that and making them become more think tanks and innovative, um, would be a welcome change within those operations, a welcome change. And I think that they would be surprised to see that the data that they are currently housing, how valuable it is. I don't think many of them have realized just how valuable that is. I mean, that they are really sitting on a mine of information that they're just not harvesting. Yeah, and with, with more innovation, a lot of people will be drawn to the entertainment area of gambling rather than the risk area of gambling. That's the smart play, right? Is quickly identify the players at risk or the players who are showing markers of harm um, and treat them accordingly and then delight the rest of them with, with, a, with a personalized entertainment. And the casinos that can get to that utopian vision um, where they're just delighting the whatever it is, the 93% of players who are not displaying marks of harm, they're the casinos that will win because the players win. Yeah, thanks, Michel. Um, the, I just want to, before we kind of, I think we probably will come back to the metaverse and then kind of draw things together in a minute, but I just want to sort of pop back to, sort of go back to the game design kind of area. I mean, we touched upon it earlier. I think it was said that, you know, all the, I think made the point that innovation happens in grey markets first. Um, I mean, does that put on the does that put the onus on the regulated industry to innovate and regulators give them room to experiment in a way to attract players away from regulated platforms? I mean, we still come up keep coming up against this this this, this regulator the, the regulator, don't we here? Because ultimately, you know, um, I think what comes out of this is a future survey every year is that the slow phase of regulation does kind of slow innovation. So I just want to hear the panel's view on, you know, um, you know, how does how does the regulated? I mean, can the regulated can the regulators kind of catch up, or is it just going to be a case of, you know, these company these companies who are existing outside of that, and then they will just kind of it was kind of said by the panel they are just going to they will just become the norm, the kind of mainstream as it comes because because basically they will attract that new audience and they will become they will become the you know what's the industry's view on that as well. Um, how can uh, how can the regulators industry can the industry can the regulators industry keep up effectively with this? Good question. But a rambling yeah. question that one. So yeah, because we keep coming well, up against that all the time. I think in general when you look at when you look at the different industries, standards are usually always a blocker or death to innovation. Um, because it takes ages uh, for them to be established and it's uh, very tightly connected to, to regulation as well. I mean, in, in principle, when you look at new content coming up, 
um, or even blending content. For example, if you blend sports with an RNG element where the RNG element actually adds value to the player protection because it makes the whole thing unpredictable and fair, um, you get a problem with your regulator because they don't understand it. Um, so I think the, the only way to overcome that is that the industry needs to work closer uh, with the regulator on a daily basis. I think there need to be new kind of, I don't know, associations, whatever, um, lobbying work where we work with, I don't know, innovation labs or whatever, as other industries do as well, right? Look what happens in fintech in, in the US. I mean, um, that's something that could, could be interesting for us as well. But uh, in general, you always have this chicken and egg or chicken and egg, you have this vicious circle that everything that is new or that is at least combined in a different way is automatically blocked until you have enough data or insights or someone, because regulators are people, right? And it's a people's business, until you find someone at the regulator's end who understands your product, um, basically. Um, and it's something that that we experience a lot at the moment because we are developing a new product vertical at the moment where we blend sports with RNG. And it's, it's a topic that you can explain with three lawyers and five mathematicians. If they don't want to believe it because they don't know it, they have never seen it, they block it, um, which is kind of natural. But I think the only way to overcome this is finding new ways of collaboration with them, involving them maybe in the innovation process somehow. I don't know how, but I just... Um, Looking at, as I said, fintech, for example, in the US, there are initiatives like that where they uh, involve financial regulators into new product development. Uh, and I think that could be something that the, the iGaming industry could adopt. Yeah. I, I, I think I, I mentioned before, it needs standards, right? You know, regulation really is there to protect the players, more so the players who are at risk, the ones who can do damage to themselves. You know, if we didn't have those players in, in the press weekly and operators being fined, there would be less onus on the regulators to make changes. Um, but by having standards, almost like an ISO standard for the industry when it comes to RG, will actually go some way into resolving that problem. And as far as I can see, there is no standard today. It's around demonstrating that you have tools and you're making reasonable or best efforts to protect the players. What about creating a standard? You know, Which takes a long time and probably doesn't solve your content issue, right? Because it's a content issue because nowadays you're not competing, I don't know, slots against uh, life or uh, life sports against virtuals. You're competing against Netflix, you're competing against Twitch, you're competing against YouTube, etc. So standards slow down the progress and uh, standards, at least as I see it, um, do not help you to innovate uh, from a content perspective. I agree with you from a data st standard point of time, um, from an interface point of view where you connect operators, etc. completely agree. But the actual issue is, as, as Lloyd said, and I really like that statement, is we have a content issue, content innovation issue. There is no new content that helps us attract younger generations, compete successfully against Netflix, against which we're competing for time, right? So I don't see how standards can actually spark content innovation. Yeah, and we, we did, uh, from Beyond Play, we did uh, run into similar issues because we're basically combining live casino concepts with uh, slots, slot games and the differences are quite clear for each one of them, but if you use them together, it's a very gray area to, to explain to, to regulators, even though it, it's straightforward, but it's a new concept and it, it's hard to box it somewhere. So how would that work in how would that work in the um how how would that work in the metaverse then? I'm just uh, just trying to think. Well, I, I think um, yeah, well, would it be regulated or no? So how how would that work? Or I mean, who, who's gonna regulate the whole thing? RNG game is RNG game of the day, I suppose. So that's what they're that's what they're regulating. The fact that people can wander into the shared space and talk with each other. And yeah. you know, I don't think it actually makes it that different from a regulation point of view. Um, 
really. I'm just trying to think of instances you might have. Um, I mean, you can almost look at it in the metaverse almost more as a hybrid of land-based and online, I suppose, um, because people are recreating, uh, you know, a physical environment uh, digitally. So um, I was talking with a project that are creating a um, uh, casino or, or casino games on the, in the metaverse. There's some really interesting stuff. So they've got um, screens where people can stream directly uh, into into their own rooms in the metaverse, where you can have Twitch uh, Twitch uh, streamers going straight in, um, playing games together. You've got games that people could be. Uh, you could have a crash game on the uh, playing on a on a video screen. Everybody playing together, standing around. I mean, there's there's some really I think interesting concepts that come out of that. But I'm not. I'm just trying to understand, trying to think about the, how the, the difference in regulation works, because you still basically just got people playing RNG games in that in that environment. Um, so I don't know if it's hugely different. But I think the, the 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 tough thing with innovation and regulation, if I think about when we started uh, on the blockchain side, is that you're working with incredibly new technology. Um, you are consistently changing the goalposts of what you're doing because you have to, because you're learning on the job and you're, and you're, you're, you're trying to do new things and things change, um, change, things change a lot. And then you, so you release generally small scale and iterate. So you're not like, you know, you can't wait. You've got to be quick and you want to be quick and you want to like quickly change things and, and keep moving as you go. And you might end up pivoting a bit further down the line. That just doesn't sit very well with regulation. It's hard to do when you when you've got very you know if you don't have fixed rules as to what you can and can't do. Yeah, and the technology is so disruptive and so fast moving that it's it's almost impossible for them to keep up. It is. It's hard. I think it's hard for us to keep up. Let alone uh, you know, it's hard for anyone to keep up. It's moving at such pace. It's insane. <laughs> I, I agree with that. Yes, definitely. Um, right, we're coming to we're coming towards the end of the hour, actually, which is yeah, which is gone, gone very fast, actually. So um, we're right at the end. I mean, I'm just going to go to everybody very briefly as well. I mean, um, very very broad question. I mean, what uh, what they see, what's going to be, what does the future hold for the industry by 2030? Who wants to take that one on? Let's go. Or is that too far ahead? <coughs> We say from, I think we'll have online know. globally by then. <laughs> online? <laughs> think what, do, oh, I mean, do we think we'll have online regulation globally by 2030? Ooh. <laughs> I, I was going to probably say no, but anyway, I don't know what else to say. I don't know, maybe. Maybe. That, 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 that's just. Yeah. Okay. Um, right, I, yeah, I think what I said. I, I, I think there's some great opportunities in the in the content space, and I think we can innovate a lot more around shared experiences, around skill-based gaming uh, or perceived skill gaming, and and I, th I think that those for me are probably the clearest and easiest things that can happen right now to attract a, a new uh, audience into uh, into the casinos. The you know other high you know High innovation things like metaverse, like NFTs, can help to, um, uh, you know, can help to grow that. But I think fundamentally, we, we need to we need to create better content that's targeted at the right audience. I, I think if we're saying 2030, which doesn't feel that far away, but um, I think what will change is how people interact with the content. So with the evolution of things like um, augmented reality. So where you're blending analog and digital worlds and interacting with that content, reaching out to pull the slot machine or laying your bets physically with your hands in the digital world. I could see that that making a play certainly towards the latter uh, part of that journey towards 2030. But yeah, so talking about experiences, I think that they're making the experiences more interactive rather than just kind of games. Andy? Christina, uh, well, to, uh... yeah, I mean, uh, basically, it's 2030. What is 2030? I mean, I would, I personally would like to see majority of, of let's say, entertainment backends running on the blockchain because I think this is the the enabling technology. Um, I mean, there are some interesting concepts. For example, I think two or three weeks ago, I saw a pitch by. Um, 
a young developer from a from a, a large operator. He was pitching a concept where he basically created a social casino that only offered um, free to play. But to enter this virtual casino, you have to buy a social token from him, right? So he's basically issuing his own currency, his own social token, for example, Stephen's token, whatever. So you buy a voucher for for 20 euros or whatever, Bitcoin or whatever, to enter this virtual space. So I think I would see the blockchain evolving massively going forward and powering this, this world, this entertainment world, because gaming and entertainment is moving closer together. And I would expect new, new business models um, to emerge based on that. Uh, also, how we monetize things. Yeah. So moving away from the traditional revenue share models, etc. Maybe it's 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 uh, simply transaction based, or it's um, which is some kind of logic for blockchain, or it's a subscription based, or you create your own currency, your own tokens, whatever. Um, I would say. Thanks, Andy. Christina? From my side, uh, I do also think that content would, would help making, uh, building communities and, and bringing people together as a form of, of entertainment. But from my personal view, I would really hope by 2030 that companies would start sharing uh, practices and protocols and, and work together to simplify uh, what it is, what is happening at the moment in game gaming. Okay, thank you. Um, right, we've, we're right, we're actually over time now, so I'm going to wrap things up now. Um, just thank you all very much again to, for joining us today and sharing your insights. Um, the, the the future surveys report um, will be available to download uh, from IGB shortly. I think Oliver needs, uh, I think Oliver needs a, a couple more days, I think, to uh, to get it to get it to, to get it kind of. Uh, finalized and, uh, and and agreed so anyway that will be available and we'll send out communication about that as well um today's webinar has also been recorded and available to listen to on demand shortly on igamingbusiness.com so you can re-watch that and share, share share with your colleagues as well uh finally thanks to everyone for doing the technicals today and otherwise um we'll see you all very soon have a good afternoon everyone thank you bye-bye thanks guys bye-bye